My name is Mehron Gribitz, and I'm the CEO of an augmented reality company. We build headsets that allow you to put holograms onto the real world and interact with them with collaborative collaborators. Uh, I predicted at uh, the TED conference last year that within five years, we would all be able to wear a strip of glass that looks very much like what I'm wearing on my face within five years and see photorealistic holograms, a layer of digital information on the entire world. So today I'm here to talk about what we're gonna see through that window in the near future. I also came to talk about uh, not only the design aspects of augmented reality, but how augmented reality will probably impact humanity as a whole. So let's get started. I don't know about you, but I like being human. I also am the CEO of an augmented reality company, so it's safe to say I like technology. But more and more these days, these two concepts seem at odds with each other, being human and being technological. Since the year 2000 alone, in the US, we've lost five million jobs to automation. Now, automation is a, a little bit of a deceptive term. We're not talking about some disembodied crane that's assembling cars. We're talking about a growing body of machine intelligence that will soon jeopardize my job and yours. It's currently the factory worker and the taxi driver, but the next step are lawyers and accountants and finally CEOs and designers. And uh, no one is really safe uh, there are two stories that come to mind. I just read yesterday about a firm called BlackRock Technologies. BlackRock is one of the largest finance firms in the world. Many of you probably know about it. They just announced they're releasing 14% of their highly, highly educated creative trader staff and replacing them with algorithms. This is happening soon. Another story I'd like to tell is one that happened to me in New York City a couple of months ago. I was having this conversation with a taxi driver, a yellow cab, and to become a yellow, a yellow cab owner, you have to pay a fee. And this person was about 60 years old, an Indian a gentleman, and he told me he put his entire life savings into this cab, uh, and all of the savings of his family was about a million point three dollars. This was about two years ago. And then Uber came along. Can you guess how much the value of the yellow taxi medallion is now after automation? 50%, okay. So not only is it less than 50, it's actually less than zero. Uh, it's, it's minus 50,000 currently, and it's hard for this person to sell uh, their, their taxi medallion at this point because no one wants it. The market is negative. So that's the world we're in where things happen like this are going to happen exponentially and very, very fast. So let's talk about how this is related to augmented reality. I have a little bit of an unorthodox thesis about computing in general that I'd like to share with you today. I believe we're, we're not starting to lose our jobs to automation because machines are smarter than us. I think it's because we're using really, really crappy tools. While in the last few decades, under the hood, technologies have become significantly, exponentially more powerful algorithmically, we're still cramming our creativity and our imagination into an outdated model of user interfaces. It's still the same old windows, icons, menus, and pointers paradigm from 50 years ago in Silicon Valley. And even your iPhones are still just a window that opens up, you close it, and some icons on the home screen. This is holding back humanity, in my opinion. And if you don't believe me, just think about me next time you cram your hopes and dreams into 140 characters. So let's talk about how we fix this. There is a silver lining, we think. If we begin to build tools that are exponentially much better, significantly better, we believe we can expand the connection between man and machine and begin to be extended by automation. Rather than putting automation at odds with the human, it can supplement or extend us. 
We could take the power and genius of human creativity and the infinitude of exponential power of computing and combine them together and we'll get something a lot, a lot more powerful, we believe. This is what drives me at Meta and this is why I'm here today. So how do we build these magical, amazing tools that I speak of? It sounds a little abstract or science fiction. At Meta, we have this saying, which is, it's not the power of the algorithm which dictates if a tool is good or not. It's whether or not I could reach out and interact with that tool almost unconsciously without even thinking about it, I know how to use it. Are there any users of virtual reality in the audience? Anyone experienced VR? Has anyone tried Tilt Brush? We got a few people who, t who tried Tilt Brush. Great. So Tilt Brush is this beautiful example of a tool which doesn't require a learning curve. You just pick up the tool and you can build very, very complex things, aspiring almost to the complexity of Photoshop and they have no learning curve. A two-year-old child can do it, and an 80-year-old person can do it. And interestingly enough, when you build zero learning curve tools, you're actually not only making things more delightful, but actually making things more successful for your application. Tilt Brush is one of the major drivers of adoption for virtual reality. So let's think about, uh, let's think about zero learning curve and build an application together. Unfortunately, getting there is a little bit harder than you'd think because our technolo technological world is currently defined by learning curves. We read manuals sometimes. We communicate through our thumbs with each other on a daily basis. Uh, we struggle to identify the differences between icons on iOS. Pull out your iPhone for a moment if you have one. I want to show you something amazing. Go into your text messaging uh, application or interface and put your finger on the iMessage box. Great. Now imagine you're sending me a voice message. Look for the relevant icon. How many identical icons exist on that screen right now for a microphone? Two. There's one in the iMessage box and one on the bottom, and they're the identical same icon. And this is the most uh, widely used application for, for SMS in the world. And each one of those identical icons does something completely different. And this is the insanity of where we are in our current day-to-day -day world. Now, a lot of people at this point stop me and say, iOS is actually pretty easy, and so is Photoshop. But as a neuroscientist, I can say that through enough repetition, you can learn pretty much anything, even a not very intuitive user interface. Just because we've learned or done something for so long doesn't mean it's very intuitive. If you want a great test for zero learning curve, give your tool to a two-year-old child or an 80-year-old person from an entirely other culture and see if they succeed in the very first try. And if you think that the challenge I'm giving you is too high, then you're proving my point. We've become accustomed to tools that are unintuitive, so much so that we believe, oh, let's just add another menu uh, item or some other keyboard shortcut, and we'll add that functionality. But I think this is really broken. So now that we're here with augmented reality, let's talk about how we can fix this. I want to build an application with you guys for a moment, the next generation of Photoshop. So indulge me, and, and if you have a good answer to the following question, raise your hand. How can we build a Photoshop that is as powerful as Photoshop, but a two-year-old child can use it? Any ideas? Get a two-year-old, two and then what would they do? <laughs> Get a paintbrush. Get a paintbrush. Well, the cool thing about a paintbrush is that you can render it in a hologram, and you could have it fit right inside the hand of that person. What else would be missing besides a, a paintbrush? Paint, canvas, what else? 3D model to paint, of course. <laughs> that was Gianpaolo. Um, maybe some tips, different brush tips. Yeah, exactly, not just the first row. 
But the, but the premise here is that if you take all those ingredients and you put them on a holographic station over here, you get something that looks a lot like an artist's studio. And that is, in fact, a zero learning curve tool. By taking our applications and rendering them in the 3D world that our senses have evolved into, we're, in fact, expanding the connection between man and machine. So I promised you two stories about the future through a strip of glass. Let's get to it now. So in four short years from today, Meta and other companies are going to release this strip of glass. And I can even give you a glimpse into that. You're going to wake up in your bed, and you're going to roll over. Much to the dismay of the Apple shareholders, there won't be an iPhone there. Instead, there'll be this strip of glass, which you put on. And in the first version of this story, you're going to have a Windows Start menu glued to your face when you turn it on. And you're going to get, a, as your eyes come into focus in the morning, a pop-up notification from your spouse reminding you to buy eggs. And then you're going to struggle to remember the gesture for how to close all of this clutter in front of your face. And you're going to remember, oh, oh, it's actually this thing. I'm going to do a little pinch gesture like that, like putting out a cigarette. And I'm going to aim it at the, th at the start menu, and I do it. But accidentally, you open a web browser over here that's showing the cat video that you were looking at last night a little bit too loud for your morning uh, routine. And you have these three panels around you that are cluttering your, your vibe, and you're trying to swipe them away, but they won't swipe. When you finally remember, ah, I have to do a, a, a gesture of a blooming flower in order to close these interfaces. So you do that, and they do, in fact, close. But you decide to keep one panel open, the cat video, just for a little bit of morning inspiration. And you go out, and you pass the refrigerator in your kitchen, but you, bam, you stub your toe because you're, too th you're looking at your uh, cat video, and you're pissed off, and you curse, and you go out the door, and you're five minutes late for work. Then you take your Uber to work. You're a, a designer or a, a controller of design machinery inside of a factory. And you just got the job about a month ago. Kind of like Photoshop, you have to remember about 100 different gestures, power user, functionality, layers, etc., in order to control this machinery. And you can only remember about a third of that because you just got the job. So you're late, you're struggling with this interface, and your boss comes behind you and says, hey, Junior, it looks like you're having some problems there. And you shrug and you say, well, you know, it's just a standard learning curve. It's understandable. But your boss may be thinking something like, it's a lot safer to let machines control machines and not have the overhead that we're experiencing in this story. So he promptly fires you, and that's the end of the first story. Now, if you think this is cartoonish or exaggerated, please note, one of our competitors has every single gesture I described in this story. Nothing is science fiction or futuristic. This is happening now. That's one version of the future. Let's talk about the second version. It's March 2021. You wake up, you roll over, you pick up your strip of glass, you put it on, and nothing happens. And then you go to the corner of your bed to meditate, and nothing happens. So you get up, and you go through your kitchen. And on the refrigerator, you see a little holographic sticky note from your spouse reminding you to buy eggs with a photo real image of the eggs brands that they like. And you put it inside your holographic tool belt and go out to work. Now, you realize you have about 15 minutes left for work to, to get to work, so you decide to go for a run. You go out to Crystal Lakes, the beautiful run next to your house, and you start running. And you see a flower that's very beautiful in the corner of your mind. And so you, you, you touch it, and out next to the flower comes a panel that tells you how much DNA you share with that flower. Turns that 70% that of it is shared, which is true for certain species of flowers. And you smile, and you keep running. And you see someone at a distance uh, that you can recognize their face, but you don't exactly remember who they are. And in a panel between you two, it says that you went to Harvard Business School together, and in fact, you both like the Grateful Dead. So you, by the time you cross paths, you shake hands and you're now Facebook friends and nothing else happens. So this is a beautiful example of the power of augmented reality to deepen the connection between us and the real world and other people in the real world. That's the highest calling, I think, of this technology. But I digress. We came here to talk about work. So I get to my, fa to my uh, factory station, <clears throat> and the user interface of my tool for controlling the factory floor looks a lot like Legos. 
I have a miniature for the boiler that I'm controlling over here and a miniature hologram for the crane where I have a big crane in the back and I'm playing with them like a child would play with their Legos. And so my boss comes in behind and, and now they're thinking a very different thought. They're thinking that by combining humans and automation together, there's something that's much more powerful than either humans or automation separately. Excellent. So in the last 50 years of computing, we've had it easy. The worst thing that could happen from a bad user interface is a little bit of frustration. And after all, we were just competing with each other, other humans. But we're about to come up to an era that where humans will face a challenge unlike anything we've changed before, uh, faced before. A growing body of machine intelligence is currently working very hard and exponentially and beginning to obviate job by job and is coming after yours as well and mine. We can very easily become that Uber driver without even thinking about it. So this brings to mind something that the Uber driver told me after we were done with our ride. We spoke about how challenged he was that he couldn't find an alternate job. But then he told me his hobbies. And his hobbies actually included painting. So what if we could empower this person with our zero learning curve design application? We can really solve this major problem that we have uh, facing ahead of us. So I want to I wanna talk about, um, I want to first of all thank you for inviting me, uh, SolidWorks and Dassault. And I want to show how it was really SolidWorks out of all the CAD companies that was the very first to identify the power of simplicity of computing in this quick video uh, that I hope we can roll. This is the CEO of SolidWorks, Jim Paolo. Now through the headset you'd see this in photorealistic uh, quality and it's immersive pretty much to the edges of where your eye can see. You can open, stretch the model, explode it, learn about it, design. And this is really the power of what happens when we bring our tools into the third dimension. And for the first time in history, we won't be wrapped around our tools and hunched over them, but they'll be hunched around us and wrapped around us. Thank you. <laughs>